Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for connecting uh, on this call. We are doing first Peter uh, in this session. So let's uh, first pray, and then we'll get into studying this book. I want to request um, any one of us on the call to please go ahead and lead in prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for uh, being out there in every situation, in every trust, in every circumstance, God. You're always there to be always faithful, God. But thank you for this day. And uh, as we're about to learn the book of Peter, God, that when we understand the different truths that you have for us, God, that we may equip and strengthen the whole world, and also that we may filled with your wisdom and speech. Thank you for the best and words. Thank you for this class and this class and this class. And pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Asha. Thank you for that. Um, so we now get to the book of First Peter. A little bit of introduction uh, about this book is that uh, it was written by Apostle Peter, as the name suggests. And um, this letter, he probably wrote it with the help of Silas. Uh, he identifies himself in the very first verse as uh, Apostle of Jesus Christ. So this is a letter coming from an apostle to the believers so it has instructions um and uh, you know it, ha it has uh, uh, some doctrine uh, just strengthening the believer guiding the believer instructing the believer this is a short letter uh, it uh, emphasizes as as i just shared uh, or, or rather we can summarize it in this way uh, it emphasizes certain doctrines and then it also has instructions for christian life and duties now, when was this uh, written? This was written uh, in the period of the early church. So we um, could estimate that it was written somewhere between 67 to 69 AD. So um, all, all, even the book of Hebrews, we know that around this time, right? Like 68 AD, around then is what it was written. So was James. So uh, the timelines are very close for uh, each of these books. Uh, it was written in the Greek present tense, uh, and um, yeah, that that is something that you know, just for our knowledge' sake, um, this was the language in which it was written. Um, then the recipients of this letter are believers. We will notice that it talks to um, believers across Asia Minor. So we'll see. Um, as we study that uh, there's a dispersion of uh, the believing community and uh, Peter is addressing all of them. So the audience is both Jews and Gentiles. The book of Hebrews, if you recall, it was primarily written to the Jews. But here, Peter is writing both to the Jews and the Gentiles. And the purpose of this letter is in anticipation of persecution, okay, which is coming up. And in uh, church history, when we study, we see that there was a great time of persecution that Christians underwent under the rule of Nero. Uh, and so what Peter was doing is he was preparing the hearts of the Christians um, regarding the um, severe persecution that was coming up. And uh, here he encourages the believers to stay strong in God, to continue to live righteous despite all the challenges around them. Um, yes, the encouragement to live righteous uh, is also drawn from the life of Jesus. We'll see that. He, he will point to the life of Jesus and say, look, when Jesus has lived in this way, um, he has borne uh, unjust afflictions. We can very much endure under afflictions because Jesus has already done it all. So that is a sort of the 
tone of uh, what he speaks in the book of first peter so let's now go into the first chapter and uh, read from there overall we would notice that there are some themes that go through each chapter so i'll try to stay on those themes that way uh, we should be able to get the message that's coming through every chapter so let's begin with uh, the first verse here could somebody kindly read uh, the first verse and soon after uh, or rather you could read the first and second verses and then we'll uh, go further Okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I heard Asha's voice. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles like that, this portion encompasses Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Britannia. According to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, and the Son, the Son, and the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, thanks for sprinkling with his blood. These two verses are introductory. Um, here, Paul identifies himself as an apostle. Uh, sorry, Peter identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Um, we know that in the early church, he was one of the prominent figures. So he doesn't really give any explanation to his apostleship. He knows that the people across the regions uh, already know about the calling that he has over his life. And so he straight away uh, states that uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he goes on to talk about the believers and he uses the term pilgrims. Pilgrims are people who are on a journey. So even the land of their birth, though they um, live they um, find their identity in that place of birth. They know that they actually belong uh, somewhere else. Okay, So uh, it, it's as if they are on a journey to that final destination, which is uh, the true uh, place of their belonging. So uh, that is what pilgrims are all about. And so here, when he calls the believers pilgrims, what he is trying to say is that, yes, we are here uh, uh, on the earth, but we are actually citizens of heaven. So though we embrace this world and uh, we give our all you know, to serve God in this world, our final destination is heaven. And uh, that's where we belong. You know, we, we are spiritual beings. Uh, and now that we are born again, we belong to our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been saved uh, and uh, live in that way, meaning uh, live in the world, but don't be off the world. Always be uh, heavenly minded, Okay, be heavenly minded. So that is why he calls the believers as pilgrims. And he points out dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia are the regions uh, where these believers are staying. So this is not to say that the instructions in um, the book of 1 Peter are only limited to these people in Asia Minor. Uh, B, because this is in the canon of scripture and it is uh, coming through to us, we know that we too can learn from the instructions of Apostle Peter. And uh, so much more can be said about Peter, his personality, the way God picked him when he was still... Um, uh, immature is a strong word, but, uh, you know, he had a personality of his own. And we know about Peter that he was the kind who spoke before he thought. Uh, he had the boldness to uh, rebuke Jesus and say, no, you know, don't go to the cross. Uh, he was somebody who denied Christ. So there are many things about Peter and P Peter's personality that stand out. Uh, but to see that God had a call on his life and uh, no matter what happened in his journey, as long as he aligned himself to the plans and purposes of God, uh, God was faithful to help him step into his calling and fulfill his calling. So that is a little more about Peter. And Peter in verse 2 says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So elect is chosen. Okay. 
uh, from the Greek word there, when we study that, basically it says they are, we are chosen by God or believers who are chosen by God. So all believers, we are chosen by God. And here he says the foreknowledge of God the Father. So again, we may have that discussion about our... Um, people already chosen by God and, uh, you know, the, the whole thought of Calvinism, that people are already uh, uh, marked by God and those are the ones who end up following Christ. So God already knows, right, whom he has chosen. Well, uh, I won't get into it again because we have discussed that though it is stated in this manner, God is a God who has given us the uh, free will that we have and he has given us the option of a choice. So even though it states that we are elect, tell me what is election if um, the decisions are made before the elections? If people have already decided who's going to vote for what and who's going to be the leader, it's really not an election because things have been uh, fixed before the election. So when Peter calls the believers elect, they are chosen. And he also goes on to say by the foreknowledge of God, the way we understand this is, uh, yes, everyone who is born again is chosen. God knew who would make that decision of uh, choosing Christ. So in that sense, the foreknowledge of God, God does not um, force us or, uh, you know, he doesn't predetermine the choices that you and I have to make in life. Okay, So uh, this is not about, you know, predestination uh, and uh, not understanding that God has given us free will. So that's how we must actually take this. So there's a balance there. In the sanctification of the spirit <laughs> for obedience and sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ. So again, uh, it states that those of us who are chosen by God, um, we do have an intended, uh, intended journey with God. And part of that intention which God has for us is sanctification. Because we know that the Holy Spirit, he is a spirit who also cleanses us isn't it so the intention of god is sanctification and excuse me the sprinkling of blood of jesus christ one of the primary things that this states is again being chosen for example when we read about aaron who was chosen for the priestly ministry the sprinkling of blood was an indication that he's been now called into the priestly ministry. Similarly, we as uh, believers are chosen by Christ to live this life for him. And he uh, also brings a greeting, says, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Similar to the greeting of Paul, um, just a blessing you know, over the people. And that's how he begins his letter. Uh, but wonderful that he wants grace and peace to be multiplied over the people. Okay, so these are initial words of introduction and greeting. Let's now go ahead and read verses 3 to 5. Could somebody kindly read it? Uh, yes, please say. Uh, sorry, I have a question. Sorry, Pastor. Sorry to hold sorry, I was just wondering if yeah. I was just wondering if um Paul Peter's um statement of grace and peace, if uh it was just a greeting or or if it's if it's um uh, if there was more to it. Because it's it seems to be something uh, both Paul and Peter keep repeating every time they they start off their hello yes they start off they start off their um letters i, I don't know if there was more to it or it's just a greeting from uh, what i have read it's just a greeting uh say could you hear me um yes sorry Yes, I can hear you. Because because there were times he would say, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you 
according to the knowledge of the father and son so i don't know if sorry for the noise of my child sorry um i don't know if um there was some there was a connection between christians expanding or increasing in the knowledge of the father and the son in other words god and the experience we have in the grace and peace as believers that's why i'm asking if there was more to just the greeting in that sense because if something is being repeated i don't know i mean i, I might be overthinking it i don't know I'm just uh, i'm just um thinking out loud to see if maybe there could be more to it than just greeting yes thank yes. you yes yeah thank you say and uh uh i would say that uh, as you think along these lines you are up to something because um yes there could be a connection it's not a very primary thing that we look into but uh, if we study further i'm sure we can find connections for example even when we talk about grace and peace be multiplied and uh, uh, you know uh, grace and peace according to the increase in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ you see there that grace uh, to be increased peace to be increased um and if you go back to scriptures like isaiah 26 3 that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee so uh, basically when we focus on god or when our knowledge of god increases there is a connection to the experience of peace that we have and in the old um uh, testament and you know during those times shalom right blessing of shalom uh, it was very key even when god taught his priest to bless the people to bless them with peace right shalom so uh yes the increase in grace and peace are important for the people and uh, uh it is connected god wants an increase okay god wants an increase and as you study it further yes i, I think you you will find something more there uh which will be a blessing for us okay but we are not dwelling on it right now thank you pastor thank yeah, you yeah sure thank you Okay, so let's go ahead and read verses 3 to 5 now. Um, who would like to read, please? Yes, go. Yes. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Should I continue? Uh, no, I think it's fine. Uh, so let's understand this and then we can go further. So um, there was a greeting and now there is something like, um, you know, uh, we glorify God like our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. So he goes ahead and says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice uh, he has an understanding of the Trinity because earlier he said sanctification by the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is mentioned and then he moves on to say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are also here. So he's just uh, exalting God. And then he goes on to say to according to his abundant mercy has begotten us. Now this begotten is uh, <clears throat> in terms of us being born again. You know, we're already born into the world, but as Jesus talked uh, that um, it is important for one to be, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God in John chapter 3. Along those lines, he's saying, begotten us. We are now born of God. We are born of God. Okay, So in the sense of being born again to a living hope. So, yes, 
<clears throat> as we look at the life that we have here on the earth life in general is is filled with um, light and uh, hope and joy so when we say the word life we can think of all these things now he is talking about our life in christ and he uses terms such as living hope so uh, he is stating that what we have in god is greater than this mortal life that human beings are experiencing without god in the equation so once we are born again you know the god kind of life the zoe life and then he says uh, living hope through the resurrection of our lord jesus christ from the dead so we've just uh, finished resurrection sunday so through the resurrection of our lord jesus christ what do we have living hope and then he goes on to point us towards the greatness of our salvation some more and he talks about an inheritance which we have which will be revealed okay towards the end or uh, once we go meet jesus it will be revealed to us and the greatness of this inheritance is such that he does not have the language to describe it in detail he only chooses to call it incorruptible and undefiled incorruptible we know jesus said keep for yourselves treasures in heaven where where uh, you know moth uh, uh, or think it doesn't get destroyed so even peter is saying incorruptible so there is something stored up for the believers which cannot be taken away which is eternal uh, which is also undefiled or which is pure and he says it does not fade away it is reserved for you meaning it is kept for us so he is encouraging the believer at the very outset and saying that god has great things in store for us and so it's really worth living this journey for god uh, and at the right time or he uses the term you know the last time it is going to be revealed to us so it's a motivation to keep living this life and not give up because there are wonderful things here in this life living hope uh, but this living hope hope carries on and then again there is incorruptible undefined um, inheritance for us which will not fade away so god has stored up wonderful things for the believer and that should be a motivation to not give up so let's go ahead now and read from verses 6 through 9 uh, could someone kindly read it verse 6 through 9 uh, in this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while if need be you may have been grieved by various trials that the gen- genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to be praise honor and glory at the, the revelation of Jesus Christ whom have not seen you love though now you do not see him yet believing we rejoice with joy in expre- uh, inexpressible and full of glory receiving the end of your faith the salvation of your souls yes thank you thank you for that mangi uh what we see here is as i said you know he's pointing to eternal things which cannot be taken away from us because what are the um, believers heading towards they heading towards persecution and in those times they may find that uh, these earthly riches or things that they desire here on earth uh, may may not be you know to their full satisfaction so things may be taken away or uh, not enough things may come their way so having made up their minds that this is going to happen he saying look there are eternal things which are greater and these things cannot be taken away from you and so he says even now 
he says in this you greatly rejoice right now you can rejoice in the fact that even though you're going through these difficulties the way uh, james said right count it all joy when you go through all kinds of uh, trials same way peter is saying you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to praise so he's going on he's going on to tell them that though we are going through these fiery trials something good is coming out and our faith is tested and when it is genuine what happens you know what comes out of it will have a uh, praise honor and glory right unto the lord and then he also points to the end of all things that you know when jesus returns when we meet him face to face ultimately there's going to be good things coming out of our testimony which actually honor the lord so the trials which one is going through and which one will go through uh, are not all in vain you know if the, that's what they look that's the way in which they're looking at it so he's saying it's it's not in vain this definitely something wonderful that's going to come out of it it will be tested yes our faith will be tested because god is interested in all of us having that pure and genuine faith so faith is something that gets tested even in the case of abraham what happened faith got tested so that's uh, uh that's something we see happen right in the journey uh, of people's lives but when we stay the course and trust god and continue to have genuine faith what's going to come out of it is beautiful it brings praise honor and glory okay at the appearance of our lord jesus christ um so let's move ahead verses 10 through 12 if anyone has a question the way uh, say stopped and asked the question you two can ask but i'm just going ahead so that we can cover as much as possible today um so yes verses 10 through 12 please Singing the song should be for happiness and prophesying about the grace that is to be yours. Search the entire church for it. In time, what person or time the spirit of Christ in them is dictating when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but to you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news. to you by the holy spirit sent from heaven things in the which angels long to live thank you asha so uh, it's quite straightforward here what uh, peter is saying is that the salvation which the prophets proclaimed okay it came by revelation so we've studied about prophecy and how by the spirit of god god is able to reveal way before time the things which will happen right in the future and that's what has happened salvation was proclaimed by the prophets and that is something you know that we are experiencing today and so he talks about how the spirit of christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of christ and the glories that would follow so how is salvation going to happen through the uh, the redemptive work of jesus christ if we study the prophecies of isaiah there are so many even isaiah 53 it's a classic passage where we read about the uh, the christ you know the atonement lamb the way he is going to suffer for us he is going to carry our sins our sorrows our sicknesses and in exchange he is going to uh, give us right the uh, redemption and the blessings of the cross and so uh, it's talking about the fact that god has already foretold through the prophets of the redemption which is to come and they revealed these things to us um and also the last portion here which says which angels desire to look into so something that we understand here is that even heavenly beings are interested in seeing the fulfillment of god's promises his purposes uh, in 
the earth or you could say in all of creation uh, heavenly beings are also interested to see how all these things are going to be fulfilled so why is he talking about uh, the prophets prophesying and the fulfillment of the prophecies uh, which is already underway right now which is salvation right now salvation has already come to the believers the reason why he's saying this is we can take it in continuation with what he's writing in the letter he just stated that if you hold on your faith will be proved genuine and uh, uh, you know you are going to see the benefits of that and now he's saying that it has already happened right whatever god has spoken those things have come to pass so the things which we are holding on for in the future uh, will also come to pass but there is a um, an insight about prophecy and prophetic word to be uh, learnt here so now we move move ahead to verses 13 through 17 uh, could someone please read this passage verses 13 to 17 therefore get up the loins of your mind be sober and rest your hope will be upon the grace that's, that is to be revealed to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children not conforming yourself to the former last as in your ignorance but as he who called you is holy you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who, without partially, judge, uh, partiality, judges according to the to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Thank you, Mangi. So, as the word therefore connects us to whatever has been spoken so far uh, this is just like hebrews chapter 12 where he says you know jesus who uh, looking at the joy which was set before him he endured the cr cross in the same way there are wonderful things which are coming up as the lord appears there is an inheritance that is incorruptible uh, undefiled it will not fade away so because of all these things look ahead and uh, know that the current trials uh, are only going to prove for your benefit and so he says because everything is going to turn out for our good he points to the mind of the believer obviously when one is going through uh, many challenges difficulties it's possible that we um, go into a mode of discouragement or disappointment or uh, be incredibly distracted from what god wants from our lives and so he says you know let's not go into that place where our mind is no longer fixed on god but he says gird up the loins of your mind so gird up the loins is a term uh, similar to roll up your sleeves you know that we use in english where one is getting ready one is getting ready to do something so that's when if i'm getting ready to do something i roll up my sleeves uh, or uh, preparing oneself for action so get ready in your minds or make up your mind that all this this experience is only going to turn out for your good and he says be sober sober is to have a, a state of mind which is balanced you know, there are no extremes in the way we uh, uh, perceive things we balance it uh, by resting on the word of god so be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace so he's calling the mind of the believer to be anchored to the word of god to not you know uh, move to extremes and also to hold on to the hope right uh, which is going to even right now it exists because he already talked about the living hope but then this continues this living hope continues and at the revelation of christ there are going to be uh, greater 
and wonderful things that we receive. And one more thing that it challenges the believer to do is one, he said, you know, let your minds be uh, stable. Let take action in your mind and make up your mind, uh, you know, to follow Christ. And uh, now he says, or rather he challenges the believer. Okay, you have your mind. You've got it up the loins of your mind. You're not letting it wander. You are focused on, on God. Uh, your mind is also sober. But at the same time, he says, we need to have a life that matches up with our faith. So uh, that's the other challenge. Starting now and going through the rest of the uh, chapters of First Peter, you will notice that he will talk about uh, our behavior in certain settings, in certain um, relationships. So it's it's beginning here. He's saying, don't not conforming yourselves to the former lust. So if we call ourselves a believer, our character, our behavior, our attitude should follow it. So that's why he's saying now our life is different. Former lusts were part of the um, not knowing Christ days. But now that we know Christ, we need to have a different life. So he says, be holy as I am holy. That is the instruction we have received from God. So let your conduct be uh, in this manner. And when we follow Christ and our actions follow what we believe, surely we are going to see a reward because God, he doesn't have any partiality. He judges each one's work um, according to what has been done. And that is our assurance that God is very fair. So we must have a life that matches up with our faith. Okay, So it's a call to action. As much as we have faith, it's also a call to action. Uh, now let's move on to the passage, verses 18 through 21. Knowing that you were exempted from the streets of a place inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, not that of the land without blemish or spot. It was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last time for the sake of you. Passage 21. The two men are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your soul by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of a perishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like bread. For all, all, is, all flesh is like grass, and all of its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Thank you, Asha. So basically, uh, there is doctrine there where he talks about the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. He says, with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You know, we've learned about this in the book of Hebrews in detail. He became our atonement sacrifice. Okay? And he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So this was not an afterthought which God had, but this was the original plan and uh, purpose of God. And it became the mandate of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he already... That is why right in the book of Genesis, Genesis 3.15, we see the uh, uh, reference right, where, where God says that uh, you will crush the head, your seed will crush the head of the serpent. So God had spoken in the very beginning that Jesus is going to come. But we know Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, Christ Jesus was made manifest. So it was not something that God came up with in the middle, you know, as a crisis management plan. But the doctrine of how God had planned this before it says foundation of the world because God knows everything. God is omniscient. He knew that Adam and Eve are going to sin and uh, he therefore had uh, through his wisdom this, this plan 
of sending his son jesus christ okay so this is all doctrine that he's talking about of how jesus came what he did and he says manifest in these last times for you so personal he's encouraging the believer and he's saying look why did jesus come he came for you uh, who through him believe in god who raised him from the dead so now he talked about the affliction of the cross but he's also talking about the resurrection from the dead who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in god so again a reassurance earlier he said you hold on because great things are coming up at the appearance of our lord jesus christ uh, and he's talking about eternal things and helping the believer know that the pain of today is but temporal okay while we focus on christ and journey forward and similarly over here in the in what he's stating about the lord jesus he shows them that look at the example of jesus he went through pray pain tribulation all that yes that's a part of the life of christ but ultimately you know we see the victory of uh, the resurrection of our lord jesus christ and so that is the kind of hope we have there is pain in the journey but there's also going to be that resurrection glory that is coming through uh, and, and so he further uh, exhorts the believer since you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren love one another fervently so there's a an instruction for community life there he says love one another fervently with a pure heart so in simple words he's calling for a sincere love for one another it, it is not two-faced but when we say that we have love for our brothers and sisters in the Christian community, it has to flow from a place of sincerity. Or in other words, we could say genuine love for each other. Having been born again, so he's reminding them, look, we're all now part of the kingdom of God. We are born again. As we saw earlier, we are begotten. And this born again experience is not a temporary experience. Uh, it is, it, it has... It is connected to eternity and thereby words like uh, not by corruptible seed, but incorruptible, meaning something that stays on. So the word of God is eternal, isn't it? Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not pass away. And then he he tries to reiterate that concept of eternity by saying that a flesh all flesh is as grass or, you know, this mortal body, uh, it will soon pass away, but the word of God endures. And thereby, the hope which we have in Christ, just the way Jesus died, yes, but he also rose again. And so we also have this hope of uh, glory in our Lord Jesus Christ, even if we face persecution. So uh, that is what, you know, we have seen so far. So I'm just going to keep moving ahead. Please stop me if uh, there is more a clarification uh, required regarding any matter. So let's now go to uh, chapter 2 and read verses 1 to 3. So could somebody please read the first three verses? Therefore, Laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as a newborn babe, desire the pure milk of wood that you may grow thereby. If need, if if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So in the given circumstances, an exhortation to uh, walk in the spirit, because he's saying, lay aside malice, all deceit. So things pertaining to community life again, because what did he just start saying? He started saying, uh, let love be sincere. Right? So uh, walk in the spirit, let there be love, and let go of fleshly, um, flesh, fleshly manifestations such as malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, all evil speaking, you know, against one another. But now he's pointing to the right way 
of uh, growing and being established in God, which is through the word of God. Remember, uh, even Paul in Acts 8, uh, 32, I think, where he said that the word of God will build you up. So take heed to the word because the word of God has the capacity to build us up. And uh, along the same lines, he says, desire the pure milk of the word. Why? Because the word of God, like milk, you know, mother's milk to a baby, um, it nurtures. And we all know that initially it's only milk that uh, generally the you know the babies survive on and uh, therefore it is pointing to the nurturing nature of the word of God how the word of God when we yield ourselves to the word of God one thing is a given there's going to be growth there's going to be uh, increase in our spiritual walk with the Lord and so he says begin to desire desire the pure milk of the word it's going to bring us growth uh, we could also look at it in this way he's he's saying that desire means a healthy baby would desire milk and so a healthy believer for growth is very much connected to the word if the believer is healthy that desire is but natural for us to know the word, to learn more and grow in God. But if that desire is lacking, then there is some, you know, uh, some issue which needs to be checked. Uh, and, and so he's saying, come on, keep your zeal in the Lord. Walk in the spirit, walk in love, desire the word of God. And then he goes on to other things. Uh, let's now read verse 4 and 5, please. And he promises me, I will be still rejected by me, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourself as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So as he is encouraging them, stay on with God, he pointed out earlier, to the fact that uh, Jesus came uh, to fulfill the redemptive plan of God. So once again, he brings the example of our Lord Jesus Christ here to help the believer understand that, look, even Jesus experienced rejection. So he says he is the living stone or he is the primary stone. In other places, uh, you know, Jesus is called as the corner stone. So these terms are used, right? Uh, and, and if you read, you know, uh, passages uh, from Isaiah and all, he is also termed as that stumbling stone. So stone is just a way of describing, right, the constant constancy of our, our Lord Jesus Christ. And here he's called as the living stone. But he also ex experienced rejection, even though he is the primary, um, he's the center of, of everything. He experienced rejection. He is chosen and precious. You and similarly, you are also chosen and precious to God. Um, and he says that who are we? Our Lord Jesus is the main living stone. Okay, he's the cornerstone. But we are also, you know, you could say com in comparison, smaller living stones. And through us, what is God doing? God is building. How is a house built? It's built with stones or bricks. So God is building a spiritual house. And you and I are living stones. And with us, with each one of us, you can imagine each of us placed like a brick in the house of God. He is actually building up the house of God. And he gives more uh, descriptions of who the believers are now in Christ Jesus. So it's all packed with doctrine. You know, we could just go jump into it and take hours and days to understand it. He says a holy priesthood. Remember, uh, after what Jesus has done, one sacrifice. Right? He became our eternal high priest. So what has that made us? We now have priesthood. We don't need a mediator, a human mediator or a heavenly mediator anymore because Jesus became uh, that person 
who sealed. He became the mediator of the covenant. He sealed the covenant with his own blood for us. So now we directly are priesthood or in other words, we have access to God. We have access to the presence of God. So he calls us uh, holy priests and we have a responsibility. We don't offer up sacrifices the way uh, people did in the priests did in the temple, but we have spiritual sacrifices which we offer up to God. So an encouragement there and saying, look, look at your destiny, look at the life that you have in Christ and don't let anything disturb or discourage you. So we're going to pause here and we will pick up from the uh, next verse, very quickly uh, answering Kennedy's question here. Okay, I don't know. I haven't studied Greek, uh, Kennedy, so I'm so sorry I don't have the answer to uh, your question. He's asking, how many tenses are there in the Greek language? Yeah, so uh, I the, what I shared with us, the Greek present tense that this... Uh, uh, book is written in it's just information that i got regarding the background of this book and secondly he's asking furnish me with the difference between election predestination and being chosen as a born servant of god in terms of spiritual calling difference between okay so election and predestination okay fine so what we'll do is how about we take a break and then we come back, Kennedy, is that OK? And then I'll share my uh, whatever I understand regarding these terms. So it's 9.52 now. Yes, thank you. Let's uh, go for a break. 10.02, we will come back and uh, pick up from here. Thank you. <laughs> 